Hello, Phil Croshaw here and a very warm welcome to Passions. In this episode, we welcome Keith Smout to the show. And a very warm welcome to Passions. And uh, in this episode, I'm delighted to be welcoming Keith Smout to the interview. Um, Keith is actually our first international guest uh, based out in Canada. But I'll let him explain who he is and what he's what he's about, and uh, obviously tell us where exactly where he's based. And hopefully, the internet will, will play will play ball, which is always slightly risky the further afield you go. But hey, you've got to do these things, haven't you? So, a very warm welcome to Passions, Keith. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. Thanks for having me. Uh, good morning. I hope I don't uh, look too tired as we're starting at 7 a.m. here in Canada with the time change. Um, you know, <laughs> that's the way it works. So when you uh, work internationally, you have to get up early. I have um, very strange hours. So thanks for having me. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Fantastic. So I guess we'll start at the, at the beginning, the most obvious place to start. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's what exactly is your passion and what is it that you do? Okay, well, my, my passion is kind of a long-term thing. I've been involved in motorsport as a career probably for the last 25 years now. Uh, it took me through Formula One um, times in Le Mans, and now uh, I spend a lot of time, obviously, the last six seasons. I've been with Formula E since it started, the all-electric racing series, open-wheel series. Um, so, in general, my passion is motorsport. Um, I come about it fairly naturally, to be honest with you. My parents, uh, my mum from Sutton Cofield originally and my dad from Shrewsbury or Shrewsbury, depending on who you are. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, you know, moved to Canada in the 50s. Um, my sisters were born in, in England and my brother and I are first uh, generation Canadians so from the family. So a very strong British heritage. And when I was a young boy, my parents made sure that I was uh, well uh, educated in all things motorsport. Uh, taking me to Mossport, where they held the Canadian Grand Prix, a track that still exists. Uh, the first movie I ever went to, which in Canada, you know, very popular, the drive-in theaters, was uh, in 1970, uh, which was uh, Le Mans with Steve McQueen. And I think uh, it's kind of been in inbred into my soul ever since then and my mind. So, yeah, I come, like I said, it comes to me naturally. Uh, had a bit of an interesting uh, childhood with my parents. They both fought uh, for, for England, of course, uh, Britain in World War II. And interestingly, my mum was a driver and uh, as a rank, you know, I think which is very similar to corporal or private. And when she left the services in 45, 46, she actually drove parts for British uh, car manufacturers, including Jaguar. And, um, you know, I've had that kind of car and automotive side in my blood 
Because when I was a little kid, I remember my mom, you know, being out on the driveway actually doing the oil changes on our car because that's what she used to do in the army. So it wasn't a very difficult thing. And, uh, you know, she was also interestingly one of the people who um, worked in the services when uh, now Queen Elizabeth, of course, Princess Elizabeth at the time was learning to drive and, you know, be a mechanic and do those things. And she was one of five service women who taught her to do things on the car and spent time with Queen Elizabeth, which is quite interesting to me uh, because it comes back full circle, which I can tell you a little bit about later on. Yeah, I mean, that, that's fascinating. I, mean, I think I won't say you're the first, but you're certainly one of the first people that we've interviewed who who probably has actually got their passion in their DNA, yeah. uh, as opposed to, you know, picked up a book when they were at school and it just interested them. Yeah. You, you, probably, um, you probably bleed motorsport, I suspect. Um, yeah, I'm uh, obviously it's my career and, um, you know, I started in professional sports, so I I, I did my university degree in, in all things uh, history. Um, I, I had decided I wanted to be a teacher. When I came out of university, um, I used to kind of work in sports and retail in the, in the summertime. And um, I had um, uh, an aunt of mine, uh, unfortunately, pass away, but left me some money. Um, and I started a retail business. And that retail business was all about pro sportswear. So in North America, you know, like you would go to a shop in England and buy your football jersey. It was the same, but it was about hockey and uh, American football and baseball and all those things. And it was quite successful for me. And it led me into meeting a lot of people. And one of the groups that I met because I was based in Toronto was the professional hockey players from the Toronto Maple Leafs, which, you know, would be identical to what the following of a Manchester United would have. Um, for instance, the, the season ticket holders of the Toronto Maple Leafs have been sold out since 1930s. Even during the Warriors, it was sold out, and it's crazy. I mean, to buy tickets for these games these days, sometimes in the playoffs, you might be paying 1500 for a single ticket. Um, so anyway, to make a long story short, I started to get to know players, and I was learning about marketing through my own retail business. And next thing I knew, I was working with players on their marketing side, NHL players. And that turned into my next career. I, I got out of my retail business and I started working with the National Hockey League and National Hockey League Players Association and had 40 player clients. And because I come from the commercial side of motorsport, it then led me to a project I was doing with the battery company Duracell. Because ultimately all these sports are driven by sponsorship money and advertising money. And I did this project in hockey and the Duracell people said to me, oh, you've done a really good job. Would you be interested in working on this project in IndyCar that we're doing? And I got involved that way and started working on the projects because I knew so much about motorsport from a, from a fan perspective, literally. I don't, I don't think there's another way to look at it. And, and strangely enough, that then led me to meeting people that, that led me to move to England and become the business development director with British American Racing with the shock villain of the Canadian driver and F1 world champion. And it's developed from there. I ended up with BAR. I worked with uh, Jordan Honda, Midland. Uh, I went and worked with Jaguar F1, was hired by Nikki Lauda, worked with Jackie Stewart. Uh, Jackie Stewart, you know, a uh, great business person as well as a fantastic champion who taught me a lot about the commercial side you know, in my time, and it's just developed from there. I, did, I worked on the movie Rush um, because I was friends with the Hunt family and, of course, knew Nikki Lauda um, from my days at Jaguar. And, of course, it came full circle to me. My mom had worked for Jaguar when, when she was out of the war, and now I was working with Jaguar. And, strangely, the full circle part of that is, uh, you know, I worked with the Queen's grandson, Peter Phillips, who I still am acquainted with even to this day, but the, I just found, always found it interesting that everything I did became a full circle back to my mum and her kind of entrepreneurial driven spirit. And even though um, I worked in different companies, um, you know, it, it was always more of an entrepreneurial role when you're in the commercial side, finding the money and doing all those things. So I always, I think my whole career really fundamentally goes back 
to the passion my mom had for things and the things that I got caught up in with my mother. So it, that- it, it's been really kind of interesting, that perspective. Even to the point my other passion, which relates, is sports cars. Um, I have a fairly uh, decent collection of Jaguars. Um, even though I don't work for Jaguar now, <laughs> I still have them. Um, so they start back with a 66 E type. And the interesting thing from that perspective regarding that car is it's a, it's a, what they call opulescent maroon series one, uh, E type. And when I was five years old, my mom gave me and my older brother Corgis and mine was an opulescent maroon 66 E type coupe which I still have downstairs in my kind of like memorabilia life of motorsport collection. Um, and then that when I had the opportunity, that's the exact E-type I bought maybe five or six years ago now. Unfortunately, my mom's passed away, never saw it, but um, you know, it's got, again, it just all ties back to it. And then I've uh, on top of my work in motorsport, I've got a small uh, British restoration business in Canada. So I restore British cars as well. I call it a hobby, an expensive hobby. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, so um, gosh, gosh, lots that's so much there to cover. Uh, could be on here for three hours on the, at this rate, um, which is wonderful, by the way. Um, yeah, so um, I th- I'll just ask you very quickly because you mentioned their Formula One and obviously uh, a relationship with and some history with Formula One. Uh, mm-hmm. We're recording this just um, on the back of. Um, what has been a pretty amazing achievement by Lewis Hamilton in Formula One. Um, And, you know, it's one of those things where um, I think it's a great example what Lewis has done as as passion driving everything. Um, What were your thoughts on on that achievement? Do you think it it really is a, we thought that with Michael Schumacher, but uh, do you think it will be, it will be beaten? Well, I mean, that's that's the, the, the getting beaten part. I mean, I assume that it will happen probably someday. Uh, although I think it's more and more difficult uh, to accomplish what he has accomplished. I think it's in- incredible. Um, you know, I obviously worked in F1 during the Michael uh, Schumacher era, uh, was fortunate to be acquainted with him. I would never say friends, but you know, most of the people in the F1 paddock knew each other and, and got along pretty well. Um, you know, there was an amount of camaraderie and, and Michael was an incredibly driven a person, probably one I've, you know, never seen so driven. But I would say Lewis is equally matched in that desire um, to keep moving forward at all times. And uh, I have to say, I just think it's an incredible accomplishment. I think for a, a boy who came from very little to do what he's done um, is also, and I think it's a great credit to his father and his family. They have Ability they had to push and I think that people like Ron Dennis have to be thanked of course um, that gave him the foothold and the foundation to become what he is but I also for me have complete respect for what he stands for as well um, a lot of people look at sport and say uh, you know you shouldn't be driven politically or you know social commentary but I think that you know when, you know, when, when, when you're a black man in this a current world, um, everybody who has a pulpit needs to have something to say. So I'm a big supporter of uh, his actions that way as well, um, but phenomenal. I mean, a lot of people will say, you know, Mercedes is such a good vehicle that you shouldn't expect anything different. But look, look every teammate that's come in there, they're minus maybe Nico Rosberg for one season. Um, he is completely dominated at all times, right? And when you see yeah. the way he won on the weekend, it was just a master class. And, you know, I don't obviously work in F1 anymore, but I keep in touch with a lot of friends and I still watch. Um, I'm always concerned about the sport at a level because I think that dominance is never good, <laughs> even mm-hmm. though I'm saying this being in Formula E and knowing that our team has dominated the last three seasons. Uh, as you mentioned, you've had Mark Preston on. Uh, he's our team principal and a good friend of mine. We've known each other from F1 and worked together there. And, uh, you know, we've won three championships ourselves. And I, literally, if you take the um, desire to win out of me, my rationale would be it's not a bad thing if somebody else wins, right? Or it 
become ultra competitive. And I think that that's unfortunately what F1 is missing. And I think that that's why it's always, you know, it's a, it's a sport of haves and have nots. And, you know, there's no real equilibrium uh, for them to have the ability to b bring that back together until they decide to be uh, cost productive, you know, and reduce. Yeah. There needs to be these things happening. Uh, yeah. You know, and I, I listen, I would love to see Lewis Hamilton battle with all those guys in the same car. But I'm fairly sure that he'll still beat people because I think Michael Schumacher is identical in one thing. It's kind of like our champion on our team, not the current one, but the one that won the two years before, John Eric Byrne. In Formula E at those times, he always had like a half second that made the difference. And Schumacher and Hamilton have that as well. Maybe it's only hundreds and tenths of a second in F1, but the reality is, is they all have that ability to do something special. I, I, I it, it's, it's outstanding to me uh, to see that type of thing. I was a competitive swimmer, nationally ranked in Canada, and I have some Canadian records. And to see, like, I felt like I was super dedicated to what I did. But to see what these guys do, to take it to that extra step, to me, is incredible. And I... I remember the very first Autosport Awards I went back in, like, 98 or whatever it was, 99. I can't remember the year exactly. But Lewis was there. It was the year he was given the Autosport Award when I was there. And, I mean, this was this little 11-year-old, you know, tiny little guy. And uh, just to, to think that that's what he became is Amazing. So, well, sorry, you, that's a long-winded No, no, no. Yeah, but you mentioned their Formula E, obviously, a few times, and I mentioned it on the intro. Yeah. So let's have a chat about Formula E. Sure. Um, just, just first of all, tell us a little bit about uh, what your role is within Formula E and, no and, and your focus. Yeah, so I've been in the sport is going into season seven. I've been there since uh, month two of the sport. Uh, I'm the chief commercial officer for DS Tachita. We're the three-time driver champions and two-time team champions. Uh, the last three years. Um, I My role is uh, quite varied. Um, I would say I'm the business side of the team. Um, my job is to uh, acquire the money, the sponsorship, the business deals, um, you know, retain all the new partners we have, create the marketing platform, you know, make sure the team looks right, deal with the hospitality, deal with team kit. There isn't a business function that I don't do. And because the only way to support the technical side of our team is to ensure that we are well-funded, well-positioned and marketed. And in a way with our parent company being a Chinese company who hadn't is very sports oriented, but not motorsport oriented. It's been a long process of, education they're incredible mm -hmm. smart people but you know you have to educate them about what the sport is and how the business works because i think that motorsport is incredibly unique in the way that it works and you're always driven to need uh, an extreme amount of funding funding even though formula e is much more uh, cost productive and cost realistic compared to um, Formula One. Uh, it's still a large sum of money to operate a team that travels internationally. The big thing for me was, and I'll be completely honest, as I said to you, I own Jaguars that, you know, are noisy and loud. I don't drive them very much, but, you know, I do drive them. Um, and even myself, I had moved from Formula One, and I, when I came back to Canada, I wanted my daughter to be educated and grow up here. I worked in the music industry for four years, and, and then Mark was, do you want to come and look at Formula E? I was quite skeptical myself, you know, the lack of sound and, and all these things that people talk about. But I have to say I converted very quickly, and in my racing career, I've enjoyed it more than any... Um, thing I've done. And I, not only from a, a spectator and competitive perspective, do I find it more exciting um, and very different because the strategy is incredibly different compared to what Formula One about. Formula One is put your foot to the pedal and to the floor and go. We are about coasting and we are about regenerating great. And I think that those things really make a difference to what the sport is all about. And of course, our whole 
methodology is to bring the um, the races to the people in city streets. Not you know, you don't have to drive up to Silverstone and take six hours of traveling and walk through muddy fields. You know, you can get off the food station uh, at the O2 Center. You know, when the new um, when racing returns to London, uh, probably 2021. The reality is that we can you know bring race to the people, and that's a big difference for me. Also, on top of that, I think the most important thing um, is that we are being environmentally friendly. We are being sustainable. And if we want to look to the future, these things are completely necessary or we will not have a future as far as I'm concerned. So I feel like as, a, as a young person, I was very uh, um, politically motivated and uh, listen, honestly, a very left-wing kind of guy uh, growing up. And I, I don't mean in an extreme way, but you know, my, my band of choice was the clash. You know, and so I come, I come from that, and uh, I was very fortunate to end up knowing and being friendly with the lead singer of the band before he passed away, and doing some work with Joe Summer. And so I believe in taking care of people first and foremost. And I think as a sport, we can entertain people, but we can be all about environmental causes and sustainability. And I have an 18-year-old daughter, just to give you an idea how this goes. I've been around Formula One all my life. We have Formula One drivers stay at the house, you know, people visiting, go all the places. Zero interest from my 18 year old daughter. She's 18 now or so, when she was 13, no interest. Formula E, not only does she find the drivers cute, of course, as she grew up, but she thinks that I'm doing the best thing I've ever done in my career, which is be involved in something that means something to the world. And I think that the young people that are growing up today are as much ridicule as we give them. That's the thing they care about. It's changed, and they're kind of like, "Well, Dad, you guys have helped add to messing up the world. Now you have to fix it. So at least you're doing something to fix it." You know? that's, yeah, so that's my major motivation, to be honest with you, is what my daughter thinks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, the uh, the sound just went a little bit iffy there oh, for a I second, uh, Keith, because because of the internet. It seems to have gone come back again now. But this this is what it happens. You say it's like, you know, you, come on, you could have flown to Manchester just to do the interview. I mean, come on, it's, it's all the tree, it's all the trees around my house probably <laughs> dropping. My wife, I said no. Plus. Uh, we have about 20 centimeters of snow right now, so there yeah, you go. <laughs> that, yeah, well, it's obviously, yeah, that's fantastic. Okay, so um. One of the things you mentioned a few minutes ago, actually, something that we, we're involved with quite a lot in, in in what we're doing with passions is personal brand development. And I'm just taking mm. you back then to you talked uh, a bit about the sports people that you looked after. And, uh, yeah. of course, um, what's interesting, I think, is that personal brand was always something that was very much around celebrity back in the past. But now there's yeah. a lot more talk about personal brand and the importance of personal brand in the age of social media. Yeah. Um, is that something that's key in, well, in, now in Formula E, is, is, is personal brand key as well in terms of the progression of the sport? Um, yeah, I think the reality is that all fan bases, no matter what demographic you have, is they are driven, as you said, by social media these days. And so, you know, 90% of the drivers are on top of this, whether they're doing it themselves or whether they have people who do it. And then we obviously have every social media channel in our team because this is how you find people, you know. Uh, if you don't find those people and you don't embrace them and give them access these days, people just aren't interested. And even Formula One, which took a long time to come around to the kind of modern world in a way, and I, I think that was just driven by Bernie Ecclestone's, you know, ignorance about that area, not because he was purposely being ignorant. It's just that, you know, old school is old school. It takes a long time for people to come around. So it's absolutely imperative. And the because this sport is so focused on being money-driven, unfortunately, you have no choice. Because if you don't, you don't build that base. And without a foundation, you can't create anything. And I think 
we're very fortunate because we have the most manufacturers in any motorsport by far, right? You know, eight of our 12 teams are all manufactured based, all the biggest companies in the world. And so there is quite a bit of um, application of budget towards social media and to the brand. And even, you know, it's not even just these days about the drivers. It's about individuals on the team. Sometimes you have to be building your brand. Mark Preston, um, in order for us to always have the ability to put ourselves out there, we have to do a lot of things with our team principal. And he ends up, I don't think celebrity is the right word. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't, I, I don't want his autograph. But, <laughs> you know, the, the reality is, is that that there is that foundation that's necessary that you uh, push these things out. And we we like to create stories from our PR department, which is another responsibility I overlook, uh, oversee, and, you know, about everybody, you know, there's, it, it's interesting on our team, we have, I think it's 13 nationalities, right? And, you know, women and men, and French, English, Canadian, Australian, Spanish, German, you know, I, and Chinese, we, we kind of have a real um, melting pot of people, which, um, you know, if we look at the way the world is these days, that's probably the best way to be. Um, sometimes, as Mark and I say, it's a bit dysfunctional, we think, but it always comes together at the right point, right? And it, it's it's proof positive that those things work so well. But we like to promote everybody, not just, you know, not just the drivers. But, the driver, yeah. 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 I mean, the drivers are obviously ultimately important, but we take an amount of effort we have to do with them but they also then have all their own entourage of people even even in formula e which is a growing massively all the time it's the, but still smaller than the infrastructure because we try to keep the infrastructure small not only for carbon footprint but for budget and you know weight and all the travel requirements that we have um, it makes the sport more sustainable but they still have a group of people who are working for them constantly, right? And so, you know, we're doing everything, every channel there is to do and more. 